Thank you so much, Jordan, and welcome everyone to It's Getting Hot in Here. Um, my name is Nataki Osborne Jelks. I'm an assistant professor in the Environmental and Health Sciences program at Spelman College and also co founder of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. And I'd like to welcome you to our program on this evening. Um, we'll be talking about a new project called Urban Heat ATL um, Mapping Urban Heat Islands in Atlanta with Community Science. Next slide, please. I wanted to briefly just mention um, the collaboration um, that has uh, come about to, to bring you this program this evening. Um, as I said, I'm with um, Spelman College as well as the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. So representing uh, and wearing sort of two hats in this collaborative. Um, we're also partnering with the um, Global Change Program and the Urban Climate Lab and the Center for Serve, Learn, Sustain at Georgia Tech, the Partnership for Southern Equity, um, Harambe House. And obviously we're very um, fortunate and excited to be a part of the Atlanta Science Festival. Next slide, please. So what is Urban Heat ATL? Well, before I tell you that, I wanna tell you just a, a little known fact. Um, and that little known fact is that extreme heat is the leading cause of weather related deaths in the United States. Urban heat islands in particular disproportionately affect vulnerable communities. Um, and heat extremes are particularly deadly in densely populated areas uh, and urban centers such as Atlanta. Research has shown that in many other cities, maximum urban heating often occurs in locations that reflect the compounded impacts of historic racism, um, including the legacy of redlining. And we want to better understand how this phenomenon plays out in the Atlanta area. Next slide, please. So the mission of Urban 8 uh, Urban Heat ATL is that we are going to deploy, and actually we've already started to do that, deploy students and community members um, in Atlanta to help us to map urban heat islands. Um, and we're going to be looking particularly at the impacts that relate to climate change on frontline communities. And these are the communities that are often hit first and worst by climate change. We're also going to be looking at the role of green space, urban green space, city planning, and energy burden in shaping environmental justice priorities um, here in the city of Atlanta. Next slide. So in terms of how it works, um, we have deployed um, our student and community scientists with a small mobile pocket lab temperature sensor. Um, and they have already begun um, to collect temperature data in a number of neighborhoods in, the, in Atlanta and in the Atlanta metropolitan area. Next slide. So we mentioned this term community science, and I thought that it was important for us to mention what community science is. Um, it is a participatory approach, and, and there is not one single definition for community science, um, but this definition from Public Lab says that community science is, collaborative, is a collaboratively led scientific investigation, exploration, um, and engagement in the entirety of the scientific process. Um, and when we think about it in the context of the community members who are contributing to this process, both from a perspective of helping to collect the data, as well as helping to shape what this research looks like, we have to lift up the fact that community science honors community knowledge. Um, it respects community agency. Um, it advances justice. And so this is very important for the work that we're doing. Um, while we could just try to understand um, what the urban heat island effect looks like in Atlanta, we're going to take it um, several steps further to see what those implications are for vulnerable communities um, and to make sure that we are making recommendations, um, appeals for planning and policy decisions decisions that need to be made and implemented to protect those communities who may be most vulnerable to the urban heat island effect. And with that, I am going to pass um, or introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kim Cobb um, at Georgia Tech, who will talk a little bit about some of the preliminary data that has already been captured as of this weekend. Thank you so much, Nataki. And it was great, it's honored to be a part of this partnership that we're discussing tonight. And I can't wait to hear from our esteemed panelists. Um, my name is Kim Cobb and I'm a professor in the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech and the director of our Global Change Program at Georgia Tech. And thrilled to be working with Nataki and all of these amazing community partners, including the city of Atlanta, and thinking about how we can learn more about this phenomenon. And as Nataki was talking about, bring some policies to bear. Um, next slide. 
So this is just to ground you and in, in the place that we are working on this project, you're going to see a lot of math. So here is a base layer of our, our fine city in Atlanta. Next slide. And here is a different kind of map of Atlanta. In this case, we're looking at the patterns of temperature, surface temperatures during a particular day in March a couple of years ago uh, when NASA satellites were able to retrieve a very high resolution image of temperatures in and around the metro Atlanta area. So what you're looking at here is a, literally a heat map where the red colors are the hottest temperatures and the, green, the orange and yellows are the cooler temperatures. And you can see all those reddish temperatures topping out at about 73 degrees on that day, uh, really located in the core of the urban area and the cooler areas uh, around the urban area. And this is really the, a classic map illustrating the phenomenon of urban heat islands. Next slide. And what we're trying to do is get a much more granular view of these temperatures in the places where people live, where they work, where they play, so that we can have a much more refined understanding of the exposure, the vulnerabilities, uh, where the problems occur. We want to be thinking about things like bus stops, uh, city parks, uh, sports playing fields, et cetera, so that we can really hone in on some of these acute risks and then, of course, uh, work with the city and community partners to do what we can to provide these evidence-based recommendations going forward. So these are the profiles that our students took over the last, uh, this is just collected on Sunday, so very fresh. The students have had the sensors for less than a week now in their hands. And in this case, they uh, have the temperature profile as they walk around their neighborhood. So you can see some retrievals from Georgia Tech in the northern part of this map and Spelman College in the southern part of this map. And in this case, the temperature range observed during this particular hour long window on Sunday ranged from about uh, a low of 63 degrees Fahrenheit in the yellow temperatures up to a, a full uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit in some locations where these students were sampling. So this may not be extremely overwhelming as, as a data set right now, but again, it's early in this campaign. So what I'd like you to do is think about what would happen if we were able to get about a hundred times more data on this map than we currently have and layer up the information that we're getting so we can make some very robust findings about where it's hot and where it's not in our Metro Atlanta area. Next slide. And if we zoom down to Spelman College with this particular student's profile uh, walking the campus there, uh, you can see that in this case, the range is, is very similar to what we saw before, um, some hot spots and some cool spots. But on this slide, I really want to draw your attention to the uh, spatial resolution that's covered by the best available satellite data we can access about uh, urban heat from space. Uh, this is the NASA satellite data. And those grid, uh, those grid cells are about 100 meters or 300 feet or so uh, at a side. And so if you look at the Spelman data that the students were retrieving, you can see how much more detailed information we can get from these community scientists. Next slide. And so I just wanted to overview some of the quick facts um, about this campaign that I think are going to make it exciting for the student participants, a great learning exercise for them, provide a foundation for the research level data that we're hoping to use, not just for this project, but for other research projects that focus on urban heat going forward. I know uh, Dr. Marshall Shepard may speak to some of that in a second. And also, of course, think about how we can leverage the community partnerships that we have towards the greatest kinds of policy relevant facts and, and recommendations that we can bring. And so this uh, campaign has attracted 86 students already from the two different institutions here. We have faculty from both Spelman College and uh, Georgia Tech involved right now, looking to engage others as well across the academic partner network. And we have three uh, non-governmental organizations that Nataki already mentioned, uh, really around the table and actively engaged with us, um, including, of course, the city of Atlanta itself through the Office of Sustainability. Thank you to Shelby Busso. And as well, um, we want to recommend, uh, we want to note that this campaign will extend not just through the Atlanta Science Festival, but this is going to be extending over the next six months or so. And we all know that the extreme heat that we face in Georgia and Atlanta is happening in late August or early September. So that's our target for extending through this period. We'll be building up capacity, building up the maps. So that brings me to my last talking point, which is please go visit our website, urbanheatatl.org, where you can join our mailing list 
keep informed of events and watch that amazing map of student temperature data grow richer and richer by the week. So with that, I think we are going to turn to our panel. Next slide. I'm going to be introducing our moderator for this evening, Dr. Chandra Farley, and uh, she will be introducing the panelists in turn. So Chandra Farley, we are amazed to have her here tonight moderating this panel, given her expertise. Uh, she is an activist at heart and credits her parents with instilling a sense of duty to always do what she can to advance justice and fairness. Currently, as the Just Energy Director at the Partnership for Southern Equity, Chandra leads a team of program staff and organizers towards developing local and regional strategies to advance energy equity through coalition building, leadership development, community organizing, and leveraging data and research, which is why we're so happy to have Partnership for Southern Equity around the partnership circle here. Understanding the equity impact of the sourcing and commodification of power generation is critical for marginalized populations such as Black people, communities of color, and low wealth communities. While unfamiliar to many residents, equity-centered energy and utility policies significantly enhance household economic stability and improve the overall quality of air, water, and other natural resources that affect our health and well-being. Chandra is a graduate of EPA's Environmental Justice Academy, President Emeritus of the Environmental Justice Academy Alumni Association, co-chair of the Hive Fund for Climate and Gender Justice Advisory Board. She serves on the board of directors for Community Movement Builders, Georgia Conser Conservation Voters Education Fund, the People's Justice Council, and Alabama Interfaith Power and Light, and GreenLink Analytics. Wow, Chandra, we are super thrilled to have you here with us tonight, and I'll let you take over the introduction of the panelists. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, I'm tired uh, listening to that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nataki, for the great um, introduction and to the project. I'm really looking forward um, to this conversation tonight. And I am excited to um, introduce these um, wonderful um, speakers that we're gonna have tonight, all folks that I look up to and look forward to learning from. Uh, we have Dr. Marshall Shepard. Um, Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at UGA where he also serves as, as the director of UGA's Atmospheric Sciences Program. That's why he always has that cool UGA athletic gear. So um, Dr. Shepard currently chairs the NASA Earth Sciences Advisory Committee, um, is the host of the Weather Channel's award-winning show, Weather Geeks, a contributor to Forbes Magazine, and was recently elected to the National Academy of Engineering, one of the highest honors that a scientist or engineer can achieve. Congratulations, Dr. Shepard. Uh, Dr. Shepard is frequently sought as an expert on weather, climate, and remote sensing, and routinely appears on CBS Face the Nation, NOVA, The Today Show, CNN, Fox News, and The Weather Channel. And he's also written for CNN, Washington Post, and the AJC, and has been featured in Time Magazine, Popular Mechanics, and NPR Science Friday. Welcome, Dr. Shepard. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jalon White Newsom. Uh, Dr. Newsom's personal and professional experience spans multiple sectors, disciplines, and geographies. She is currently pursuing an independent consultancy, empowering a green environment and economy. Super excited about this, Dr. Newsom. Following a five-year career of working as a senior program officer at the Kresge Foundation, where she led the foundation's work addressing the, inter the intersection of climate change and public health. Um, and Dr. Newsom, I still have my cruise water bottle um, from the Atlanta meeting like <laughs> three years ago. So um, previously, Dr. Newsom has served as director of federal policy at West Harlem Environmental Action Incorporated, leading national campaigns and a 42 member national coalition of environmental justice organizations ensuring that the concerns of low-income communities of color were integrated into federal policy, particularly on clean air, climate change, and health issues. She's also a lecturer at the George Washington University in DC and an adjunct professor at Kettering University in Flint, Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Newsom. 
And finally tonight, we'll have Dr. Jeremy Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman serves as the chief scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia, where he previously served as the climate and earth science specialist, producing climate science educational content. Dr. Hoffman currently teaches physical geography at Virginia Commonwealth University, where he combines in-class lectures, small group deliberation, and real world data collection to bring the concepts of geography into the college classroom. That sounds just like the combination of the work we do at Partnership for Southern Equity around, around energy. So looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, Dr. Hoffman regularly engages with audiences of all ages and background to explore climate change and how it works on multiple timescales from human decades to geologic millions of years and was recently a lead co-principal investigator for urban heat island studies in Richmond, Virginia, Washington, DC, and Baltimore, Maryland. And unfortunately, Dr. Mildred McLean is not able to be with us tonight, um, but we wish her health and healing um, as she is recovering from some complications from um, back surgery, but she is always, um, so important to me and so important to many of us as a, a pioneer and legend in the work of environmental justice. And I know how much um, she loves being a part of the work with tech and um, this project. So we will look forward to learning from her as we go forward in another space and we will dive into our conversation tonight. So welcome panelists, how are y'all doing? Doing well. Very, very good, good. So I joked early on that I, um, one of my things that I wanted was to have um, Nellie's song, It's Getting Hot in Here, um, playing in the background. Um, I definitely needed an instrumental because the language now isn't quite, I don't feel the same way that I did back in my college days on the <laughs> dance floor listening to that. Um, so, um, so let's dive right in um, to, to this research. And, you know, when we talk about vulnerable community members, I really appreciate Nataki lifting up. I had actually pulled up this article getting ready for the panel tonight. Um, a recent article from NPR that linked the racist housing practices from the 1930s around redlining um, to hotter neighborhoods today. And so when we talk about this in the context of vulnerable, we're really talking about people that have been made more vulnerable to these impacts. Um, and I'd love to hear if you all sort of agree with that language um, change. But um, what are the problem spots in Atlanta, and welcome also um, Dr. Hoffman to chime in from from other places. And I will. Start I can, you. I can start that question because I actually had us. I, I pulled up something from some of our research, Chandra, that might be relevant to to that particular question. So I'm going to quickly share the screen. Uh, I'm not going to show all of the slides that you'll see, but there I'm going to pull up one particular one. Uh, can you all see that? Those, those slides? Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna just play from, the, but I'm not gonna show all of these. So, um, so the question about Atlanta, um, this is a version of what uh, Kim Cobb showed earlier. Uh, this is the surface urban heat island. And I, 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 I've actually studied heat islands. And one of the things that we have to understand about urban heat islands is that there are actually three different urban heat islands. And so uh, as we're talking about heat islands tonight, it's important to sort of characterize which one we're talking about. So the kind like I'm showing here and that Dr. Cobb showed earlier is what we call the skin temperature of the surface heat island. You're taking the temperature of the surfaces. And so here you see the sort of urban corridor here is some work uh, from one of my colleagues, Dr. Steve Holloway and his group, I believe. And it shows you the racial breakdown of where people lived in Atlanta and surrounding areas. 2010, I grew up up here in the nice cool suburb of Canton, Georgia. It's my hometown up here. But if we look closely at this region here where we see a large black population and people of color, we, the well-known I-20 divide, if you will, or the I-20 divide, the line. Um, much of that 
coincides with some of the most sort of rigorous heat that we tend to find in the city. And so uh, the work that the, the Heat Island Project that Spellman and Georgia Tech have embarked upon uh, will provide really useful information on the canopy layer heat island. I remember I said there are three kinds. There are the skin temperature heat island, the canopy layer heat island, there's even something called the boundary layer heat island. We won't worry about that tonight. So the canopy layer heat island is basically what we're measuring at about one or two meters above the surface. Interestingly enough, and this is some, I've, I've, I've talked to one of the Spellman PIs who reached out to me this week, it depends on what time of day you're taking those really cool measurements that Dr. Cobb showed, uh, because the canopy layer heat island peaks uh, at night or overnight early mornings, whereas that skin temperature heat island is more evident during the day. So I'm going to be uh, very excited to see some of the results from this uh, project going forward, because I, I think it's one of the more, more unique sort of efforts that I've seen in this regard. So kudos to Spellman and Georgia Tech. So uh, we know that we're redlined and we know that there are other vulnerabilities that have placed uh, marginalized populations in, in uh, excessive heat zones in cities. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. And what was the third that you mentioned? We have skin, we have yeah, canopy. The, and the boundary layer heat island. So I'm getting I'm a little meteorology 101. I am a meteorology professor. So the boundary layer is the first one kilometer of the atmosphere. So if, if you go up from the surface up to about one kilometer above it, that's called the boundary layer. It's the layer of the atmosphere that can still feel the influence of the surface. So uh, it's important to understand that because when people talk about the heat island, they often talk about the heat island and they're actually different kinds and they have have different characteristics depending on what time of day you're in. Thank you for that. See, this is love ATL Science Festival. Okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Newsom, I'd love to toss this question to you. When we talk about vulnerability to extreme urban heat, what are the factors that shape that vulnerability? Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I'm not from Atlanta, but I feel very close like y'all are family. So I'm happy to be here. I want to give honor to Dr. McLean and her absence because she is a shero in many ways and honor the lands that I'm calling from in southeastern Michigan way up here with our heat wave of 72 degrees today, uh, the original lands of the Potawatomi. So I appreciate this question about vulnerability because I really always emphasize that the vulnerability is not the people, it is the system and institutions that make people vulnerable. I got started in this whole extreme heat climate change work about 15 years ago when I was taking care of my grandparents and realized that low income communities, communities of color, our houseless citizens were feeling the brunt of a system and an institution that did not take care of them. So when you think about these multiple things that make our communities vulnerable, it's the fact that we don't have systems in place to take care of them, that there are all these other risk factors, whether it's the housing, um, the fact that folks are isolated, not having backup energy systems, not being able to afford energy, let alone pay an air conditioning bill. And I could go on and on, but it's the same factors that we see that make folks climate vulnerable to flooding, to all these different risk factors. But I wanna emphasize the fact that when we talk about the urban heat islands and, and Dr. Marshall, I never knew it was three different ones. So I'm learning already taking notes. It, part of my work was really looking at the outside temperatures and the inside temperatures and, and taking the monitors and understanding what's happening outside, but also the hazards within the home. And so when you talk about vulnerability, it's the systems and institutions. And it's also the fact that our homes become hazardous to our health because of the external temperatures. And the building envelope, so not being weatherized and all of all other factors. So I think this concept of vulnerability and the work that this, this study is going to do will hopefully get into some of those, those granular factors that you can then change with policy and education because vulnerability spans beyond the person. It is about the system and the structures that we rely on to stay safe and healthy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, Dr. Hoffman, I would love to invite um, your perspective on the factors that shape vulnerability um, to extreme heat as well. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, allowing, allowing me to join in on the conversation. I feel like we got a master class in urban heat island meteorology from uh, Dr. Shepard and then a master class in understanding vulnerability from Dr. White Newsom. So it's just uh, really thrill, thrilled to be a, a part of this conversation. 
uh, when we, we did a very similar campaign to what is being pitched for the Urban Heat Island ATL uh, program uh, in 2017 in Richmond, Virginia. And we have much the same kind of uh, history in the, in the sense of you know, segregation and, and, uh, and, and redlining specifically that really through the combination of our science work with the community organizations that I see represented in this collaboration, it was really um, through that ongoing collaboration that we started to see, oh, hey, the, you know, the redlining map Oh, outlines with the food desert map and outlines with the vacant lot map and the, you know, and the, and the, as Dr. White Newsom mentioned, you know, flooding map and, and other things. And so um, when we started to really look at this uh, history at the national scale, we started to identify the exact same um, uh, patterns in multiple cities. So that um, NPR piece that you mentioned uh, was uh, you know, released after the paper that we published in January 2020 about this uh, information. And um, it's just really been uh, uh, amazing to see this historical lens applied to present day inequity because a lot of the words that were used in the descriptions of these neighborhoods actually sound a lot like what they remain today. So the words that were used in these formerly redlined neighborhoods were you know, things like odors and treeless and hot. And the words that were used for the green line neighborhoods, which remain predominantly white and, and privileged today, they were using words like wooded and shade. <laughs> so in many ways, those maps may not have created the, uh, the, the conditions that we see today, but made them lawful. And so that speaks to exactly what Dr. White Newsom was talking about. It's like these decisions that were made over 100 years ago, presenting and echoing today as an environmental inequity that has real consequences for real people. Thank you, thank you for that. So we you know, have this thread now of this linked history, um, if you will, but do we expect to see different impacts in Atlanta relative to other cities? And I'll open that up, you know, starting with you, you know, Dr. Hoffman coming from Virginia to what we're looking at in Atlanta, even, you know, Dr. White Newsom to Detroit. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to try and, and say uh, to say to, with and then you know toss it over. Uh, you know, I think it's the the physics behind the urban heat island effect. The surface in the canopy, well, the, uh, the canopy layer urban heat island effects are very very much the same between contexts. You know, domination of a human human landscape versus natural landscape is really what we're looking at there. So I suspect, based on the patterns that we've seen from Mark, Dr. Shepard's work in the past, that we'll see very similar patterns play out in the canopy layer, depending on the time of day. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. And I, and I want to emphasize this because it's, it really is important. Um, uh, and, and again, I'm trying to sort of contextualize my remarks as kind of the, the physical scientist meteorologist on the panel and understanding what the, the, the program's going to do. Um, you're going to get a very different looking heat island, uh, depending on what time of day you take that measurement when you're using the surface uh, instruments that Dr. Cobb showed. Uh, and if, if you might see a very sort of localized effect around the campuses, but sort of that broader heat island for Atlanta versus out here in Gwinnett County where I live is, is going to be uh, very different. So it's important to sort of think about those things as you're shaping policy and understanding vulnerability, because here, here's, the, here's the kicker from a vulnerability standpoint, from a public health standpoint. It's the nighttime temperatures in terms of heat that create the health disparities. It's not necessarily the 95 degree temperatures, it's the 78, 80 degree temperatures at night, what we call the minimum temperatures that are the health danger. And so that's further exacerbated uh, if you live in a heat island and you're already warm at night and then you have the excessive warming because of the canopy layer, or what probably most people think of as the heat island, the, the, the air temperature heat island uh, already uh, there. And so, to me, I think this is a triple whammy effect for vulnerable populations. You know, we talk about vulnerability. Vulnerability is exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And as Dr. White Newsom has talked about, um, everyone's equally exposed to heat, but people in those red line districts and those uh, sort of impervious surface areas without a lot of without a lot of evapotranspiration from trees. Uh, they're more exposed and they're more sensitive. And also many of those people may have less resiliency, less adaptive capacity. So uh, this is a triple whammy when you talk about people living in an urban heat island on top of heat waves that are coming this summer and then the broader climate change heating. So you've got this sort of triple threat 
of heat on these vulnerable communities. And I, I think uh, Jeremy's right. Um, the, the physics are the same wherever you are, but cities like Atlanta and Phoenix have been shown more so than maybe cities like D Detroit where Jelan is, is that the sprawling cities are bringing heat islands to places that they used to not be because you have such a sprawl. Uh, some of the northeastern and mid, mid western cities are a bit more sort of contained, but some of the cities in the south and in the, the sort of Sun Belt are really expanding. And so you're seeing problems there. Brian Stone's work has shown this. Hey, because I see Cassandra Johnson Gaither on, my colleague in Athens. Thanks for that, Dr. Shepard. This was also something I wanted to link to, and it's interesting that you mentioned Phoenix and Atlanta. So I have family that live in Phoenix, and I remember going there, and I'm thinking, goodness gracious, you know, is this is, is this place under construction? You know, coming from Atlanta, where we have this really rich, unique tree canopy um, coverage. So how does that impact um, Atlanta's urban heat? urban heat on this unique tree canopy coverage that we have. Well, I, I don't know if you're talking to me, but I'll Sorry, jump in. But yes. quick. No. Yes. So, so one of the nice things I've, I've volunteered with Trees Atlanta, and I've spoken to them on many occasions. I love the organization because they're trying to, you know, mitigate the heat island. Atlanta, as cities go, has a pretty decent tree canopy, but, but it doesn't have a significant tree canopy. So back to the share screen, uh, let's talk a little bit about, heat. again, I've got to sort of embrace my role as a scientist on the panel here. So back to the screen, uh, play from current slide. So why do we have a heat island? And that'll, that'll answer your question about trees. Yeah, this is this is physics, physics C, and stay with us. Uh, shout us out on Twitter. Uh, let people know about what's going on. While um, so we have we we get a heat island because of these four things. Cities have um, a lot of heat storing surfaces like park Best Buy parking lots, Targets, Walmarts, malls, etc. So they retain heat during the day and then they re-radiate it as long wave energy at night. One reason. Two. Most natural places have lots of trees. Well, trees evapotranspire. So like our skin evaporates, uh, sweats, and then it evaporates and cools us off. Trees evapotranspire, so that cools things too. Cities tend to have less trees, so that adds to the heat island. Uh, they also have buildings and walls and urban canyons that actually retain heat. And then there's a term called the anthropogenic heat term. It's this little term here in green that you see you don't see over here in the natural canopy. Uh, bus engines, as they drive by, you feel that heat. Or HVAC systems, those create that, that sort of extra heat. So those four things are why essentially we have a heat island. Uh, what we can do is try to offset that by putting more vegetation in cities to up that evaporational cooling, or you can just paint roadways and pavements white. It reflects more energy, not absorb, and that can, those are sort of the traditional ways of mitigating uh, the heat island. Uh, and so, yes, Atlanta is better off than some, but not nearly as good as we could be. Thanks. Thank you for, thank you for taking us down that road. So let's, we're getting into this a little bit um, with your final point, Dr. Shepard. Um, Dr. Hoffman, let's start to talk about how cities can really pull together to, to meet this challenge. So we're going to, let's have a little conversation about um, what kinds of initiative can redu reduce the vulnerabilities to extreme heat. And um, we will take this in conversation and try to speak to short-term um, down towards long-term initiatives. Yeah, I'd actually, I'd actually love to. So one of the projects that I would love to talk about that is actively reducing vulnerability here in the city of Richmond, Virginia, is a program that is funded by uh, the, the, the cruise program that uh, Dr. Jalan Newsom White, White Newsom uh, actually started. I would love to, 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 to hear because she's seen so much more work in this space. You know, uh, I would just give a shout out to Groundwork RVA and Groundwork USA and their Climate Safe Neighborhoods program, but invite her to, 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 to speak to this because that seems like I, you've seen so much more work in that space than I have. Dr. Hoffman, you better go ahead and talk. I, I will follow up. You you speak to the work and, and you were critical in that. So I'll, I'll follow up after you. 
All right. Well, so so the the, the climate safe neighborhoods uh, initiative at Groundwork USA, which is a network of nonprofit organizations that seek to improve workforce uh, green workforce development opportunities for teens. Uh, we've the Science Museum of Virginia has been very lucky to collaborate with uh, this Groundwork RVA group. Um, uh, since our Heat Island program back in 2017. And we started this program called Throwing Shade in RVA. And uh, much to what Dr. Shepard said, um, we've been focusing on expanding that kind of green space access uh, and, and working with communities and several other nonprofits that have kind of come along now and, and, and joined into our partnership to make a more holistic approach to like uh, figuring out, you know, uh, Decisions were made 100 years ago that were uh, uh, not that that uh, locked in these disparities. What do we do now to flip that script, where the community comes together to drive the the kind of policy generation and and the green space access plan for their neighborhoods? So I just give a shout out to Groundwork RVA who has continued to uh, turn it into a green workforce. Uh, skills development opportunity for teenagers while empowering communities to take action in the space around green infrastructure, tree planting, and creating their own green spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, you know, definitely shout out to all the folks that are doing the work, um, in, in particular, the importance of co-benefits. Um, you know, planting trees is more than, than bringing shade. It, it is any type of green infrastructure is also mitigating the flood risk, which again, when, when I think about communities and, and even in my hometown, it's like the same folks are suffering from multiple impacts. And that's just climate. We haven't even talked about the other stuff. So the co-benefits piece is key. And I also would like to say in terms of solutions, one of the things that we can't not not think about is behavior change and planning. And I wanna to speak to behavior change because oftentimes we, and when I say we, I mean communities and, and folks, you know, we're kind of waiting on these big policy changes to happen. We're waiting on the funding to do this and that, but we have folks that are suffering from heat stress and dying from heat every day. And so what I have really tried to do is, is it's really understand like, what can I do as an individual in my home that may or may not have air conditioning? If I'm on the 19th floor of a high rise and I'm a senior, what are the behaviors that I can take on myself to reduce my risk. And so I think it, it, as much as we talk technical, we have to also talk about people and, and how we change how they function, how they adapt so they can be more resilient. The other piece that I've seen across the country, which is critical, is the planning, right? So, you know, oftentimes things happen and we build back in the same way <laughs> or we do the same thing. So how do we begin to plan realizing that you know, we have to plan for the most vulnerable situations and to make sure those plans are good, we have to make sure that those that are most at risk are a part of that conversation. And I've seen that play out very well with an organization called Green Print Partners, which focuses on a lot of, again, the stormwater infrastructure, but also heat, but where they are bringing together the engineers and the scientists and the communities to create a plan that everybody can dig into and, and benefit from. So it's not just the engineers getting happy, but it's folks getting jobs from workforce. Um, it's folks really being engaged and maintaining. And so I think the behavior piece and the planning piece is so critical, especially when we talk about the unintentional consequences that can come from adding more trees to your neighborhood and making it prettier and doing development. And then again, who ends up getting the short end of the stick in that situation? Could I, could I follow up on her point about the planning? So uh, a couple of years ago, I was a recipient of an a, a award along with some folks at University of Minnesota and Brian Stone at Georgia Tech too. Um, and the whole point of that five-year funding was to bridge the gap between the urban climate community and the policy and planning communities. Because we know a lot of things about urban climate and urban heat distributions and so forth. Uh, but one of the things that we found, and we talked to many planners about this, they don't cover this really in their planning programs. So you're getting a degree in planning. Uh, they may talk about some of the McCarg's principles and ecology and so forth, but there is a lot of information we know about urban climate and orienting streets in a certain way to take advantage of wind flow to cool off certain streets during the during certain times of the year and uh, all types of other engineered practices that we could do that could be implemented in planning. 
uh, when you're planning mixed use developments, when you're thinking about sort of uh, communities, uh, um, uh, lower income communities and so forth, there are actually things that could be planned, but the planners don't know any of this, a lot of this we found in that study. And so the whole point is we, we, we brought together community planners, urban planners, uh, with urban climate scientists, and we met in Phoenix, we met in Atlanta, we met in Athens, Georgia, we met in Minnesota, and talked about best practices for getting this information over the fence into the planning community. Now, I still don't think we're anywhere near that, um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, hopefully data likes being collected here from this project and others, we can start to continue to have those conversations with the practitioners, the people that are actually doing the planning. So uh, I'll drop in the chat box here in a moment when I find it, a link to those series of meetings that were sort of this conversation because we, we kind of all, all silo and talk to our community sometimes and don't don't talk across those gaps. So that's a really important thing that we need to think about. Can, can I speak can I speak really quickly to the application of that? I think we've we've been able to realize that a little bit in Richmond and it's been through the uh, the community taking that information and really running with it. And I think that's what has been kind of the the secret ingredient of making uh, the urban heat island effect and the disproportionate impact on communities of color central to our most recent planning document called Richmond 300. So it really is. I've seen that happen in practice uh, while you know while participating and doing science with our community here in Richmond. So I, I agree 1,000 percent with. Uh, with Dr. White Newsom and, and Dr. Shepard on the importance of planning and get communicating with the, the policymakers at the local level. It's actually my call to action is for every one of the people that are on this webinar to email their city council person and ask them about what they know about the urban heat island effect and uh, see if you can start that kind of knowledge sharing with, uh, with, the, with the people that represent you at the most granular level of government. That's amazing, Dr. Hoffman. We are we are vibing, I can feel it, because my next question was really wanted to link back to something that um, uh, Dr. Nataki and Dr. Kim spoke to in the beginning around, we've got this data and research, we've got the community-based science, um, science support, how do we move that along towards the policy, um, particularly for some of those unintended consequences? Um, Dr. White Newsom, that you spoke to around, you know, now we're getting into gentrification because the neighborhood is nicer. So um, just, and we can go around Robin again, this will be our um, last question. We've got some really amazing questions coming through the chat and the Q and A. So how, again, just to restate that question, how we take that leverage that data and research um, towards policy that we know is centering um, first and most impacted people. I'll, I'll start off and, and I'll just say part of, I, I don't believe in research for research's sake. Um, even in my dissertation, it was like, okay, research to action, what am I going to do with it? And is this in service to whomever I'm trying to change? So actually my research questions and my dissertation was shaped by the city of Detroit's health department, by the Detroit area agency on aging and meals on wheels because they did not have a clear understanding as to why people were suffering from heat stress and, and dying. And so I think one of the things that we need to make sure, and I'm putting on my scientist hat and my engineering hat, is that we begin to do science that answers the questions that people need answers to. It's not rocket science. And so when we go and speak with planners and speak with public health folk and speak with our elected officials, we are giving them information that they can then use to serve the folks that they've been called to serve. And so one of the things I think that is so critical is that aligning our research and desire with the needs, but also I can't say it anymore, making sure that the data, both the qualitative and the quantitative that communities give is appreciated and respected. Because another situation that often happens is when you get data, in my experience, not all, from communities, and I had this situation when I was working in Maryland and all that stuff, is that it, it wasn't quality controlled, it wasn't appreciated, it, it wasn't highly regarded. And so how do we begin to kind of take the ivory towerness off of community um, collected data so it is meaningful and used to actually help 
in the planning process is not after the fact, but from the beginning and throughout. Yeah, I, I, I want to jump in on that. I just dropped a paper in the chat uh, from my doctoral student, Mariana uh, Fragomeni, who's now a professor at University of Connecticut. Her whole dissertation was on co-production of knowledge. Uh, we know that there's a heat problem in Savannah, Georgia, but we also knew that there was no, we didn't, there was not a way of talking about it with the planning and stakeholder and health communities. So she developed a, an innovative strategy for doing exactly what Dr. White Newsom just talked about, which is how do we get this sort of complex science in a, to communities in a way that it's usable. And so I would invite you to take a look at uh, the paper that I just put there in the chat. It's a collaborative approach to heat response planning, a case study to understand the integration of urban climate and land use planning. And so some of the strategies of co-production of knowledge and geo design and so forth, all technical terms, but when you read what she actually does, it's sort of co-production, meaning you are engaging the communities from the start in the process of finding out what they need. And Cassandra, uh, who is on the on this Zoom somewhere, uh, Cassandra Johnson Gaither, who's a, uh, a scientist at the US Forest Service who deals in social, social science, social sociology related issues. We've partnered before on projects. She had an excellent paper published. I was a co-author where she went into Southwest Atlanta and talked to some of the people on the ground about what their concerns about climate vulnerability are. And I think Cassandra, and I know she can comment, I think she found that some of the things that people in those communities are thinking about and worrying about are very different from the, what the ivory tower eggheads like us are thinking or worried about in terms of what we perceive to be vulnerability. So uh, I, I think these co-production approaches are going to be critical um, because we, we, we as ivory tower sort of saviors, the savior complex of ivory tower, I think we can just go into these communities and say, hey, here's all of our cool data and our knowledge base. Here's what you need to do. When in fact, we should go in and say, we want to listen and then develop a strategy from that point. Yeah, I would just continue to echo what we just heard uh, in, a, in a big way. And I, I want to give uh, ups to my mentor, Vivek Shandas, who has, uh, through our collaboration and through many of his campaigns, really worked to develop that kind of perfect model of, of moving communities towards beyond just like socialization around an issue and towards really understanding the threats in front of them. And then having the kind of impact and, and granularity of data that's allowed to be actionable. And I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I spoke, spoke to his work because he's been really active in the space. And I think it's actually one of the things happening this summer as part of the Urban Heat ATL program. Um, and, and, and I'd say uh, the, the one thing that uh, finding the organizations that are doing that local level work is so critical because each city has its own history of, you know, here in Richmond, we have annexation and, you know, continual um, uh, stuff that went on beyond redlining uh, uh, and, and highway construction and, and, you know, public housing. So uh, each context, I think generalizing and taking good ideas from other places is always a great approach, but also finding out exactly what Dr. Shepard said, saying, how can we help from the start is, is really the, 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 key, the key aspect of a community science model. Fantastic, fantastic discussion. Um, perfectly linked, I feel like, um, in my head. We've got so many questions and uh, so much information in the chat. We're going to dive into a little bit of Q&A. And what I love about um, these questions that I'm seeing are they are going to take us back to Urban Heat Island 101. So um, in one sentence, Dr. Shepard, Taylor would like to know, what are urban heat islands in similar terms, in simple terms? In simple, can you hear me? In simple terms, urban heat islands are these places that are warmer than the surrounding rural areas because there is a lot of pavement and a lot and lack of trees and a lot of heat coming from engines and HVAC systems. It's a run on Perfect. sentence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. And I think related to that for sure, um, when we talk about some of these um, mitigation adaptation activities, and this is remind me of some experience that I had at my previous organization, but I'd love to hear um, what kind of modifications, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier, what kind of modifications to the concrete and the asphalt 
um, to make them less likely to cause urban heat island effects? Well, I've got a slide for that. <laughs> I can quickly show it. Of course you do. Well, of course, you know, I, you know, when I was pledging Alpha Phi Alpha, they told me about the five P's, prior planning prevents poor performance. <laughs> so I always come prepared. Um, so here's, and they told me though that, that the last time I was showing this, you were only seeing my slides, uh, the stamps. But can you see this slide when I click on it? Can you all see that? Now we can't. You're in presenter view, um, but it's a little bigger. But, but, but can you see it? At least you can yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. these are the traditional measures that have been proposed to mitigate the urban heat island. Um, things like you know strategic vegetation, open green space, uh, lighter surfaces or high albedo surfaces, rooftop vegetation, and so forth, sun shading, increased public access, uh, and so forth. I mean, I mean, these are all kind of being done now, but something I mentioned in the chat is that we are fundamentally rethinking this for a big project that we are proposing with a group of engineers at Georgia Tech to not just sort of, these are kind of what I consider band-aid solutions to mitigating the heat island. We're thinking about with this project that we'll be proposing to the National Science Foundation, fundamentally reimagining or repurposing the heat. In other words, taking these urban heat islands, taking that heat, reusing it and sort of redistributing it and reusing it for energy and other things. So, you know, keep us in your thoughts because if that gets funded, that'll be a very interesting effort to reimagine uh, and, and actually have the ability to control uh, heat in cities for equity and justice. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Shepard. And Dr. White Newsom, I think a couple of these questions go to the intersection at which you work and TJ Osborne wanted to hear about more effective policy to uplift community health um, in these areas that are more vulnerable to um, the negative impacts of the urban heat islands. Sure. I, I mean, one of the things that I talk about a lot is, is health in all policies because health is the cornerstone of everything. <laughs> so whether you're an engineer writing a standard operating procedure or whether you're a planner working on your 50, range, 50 year long range climate plan, the impacts to the health of the communities that you are planning for is critical. Um, and so I think one of the, the easiest ways is to make sure that you have a public health person at the table. That does not always happen. Um, and, and again, that person can kind of bring that perspective and ask some key questions. But I think also as you think about health and, and not just the physical consequences of health impacts, but also the mental health pieces. And I think that's sometimes what we forget because when we think about heat stress, uh, you know, there are a lot of situations that happen, particularly related to climate change that cause mental stress, particularly on already stressed communities of color and low income communities. Um, I guess I would also say that, man, when you think about, I just lost my train of thought, but yes, health and all policies, looking at mental health uh, and physical health, making sure that public health practitioner, practitioners are at the table. And then again, I can't emphasize enough, um, realizing that <laughs> if you don't have the, the people that are being impacted as a part of those conversations, because oftentimes there are things that we can miss when we are doing policy work or writing good policy. And so I, whether you call it co-production or whatever, you know, the folks that are on the ground that are feeling it need to help actually write and create that policy and craft that policy because there are these, these physical and social infrastructures that a lot of folks that aren't from the community are not aware of. And so oftentimes we think about policy as these wonderful words written on paper that will get enacted. But again, policy also provides funding and resources to support those, those infrastructures within communities, whether it's a block captain that's going to make sure everybody on her block has water or uh, community centers to make sure that there are resilience hubs. So I think there, there's so many different ways that you can bring health into this, but the main thing is that you bring people, public health folks, and the people that are being impacted 
into whatever process that you're trying to put together. Hopefully that was clear, but. <laughs> yes, ma'am, health and all policy, um, for sure. This has been incredible. Um, there is never, ever um, enough time. I think we're going to toss it back to um, Jordan Rose, um, who's been behind the scenes and, and our host. Uh, and if that is right, Jordan, I will thank these wonderful panelists. It has been, my brain is about to explode um, from all the wonderful information. Um, so thanks so much for allowing me to guide, help guide this conversation. Jordan. Thank you so much to all the esteemed panelists and speakers this evening. It's really been an honor on behalf of Science ATL and Atlanta Science Festival to uh, partner with the Spelman College Environmental Health Sciences Program, the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, the Partnership for Southern Equity, and the Georgia Tech Center for Serve, Learn, and Sustain, and the Georgia Tech Global Change Program. If you have a, a, a response, uh, an emotion after hearing these amazing speakers, we would love to hear about it. Please go to our website and enter a testimonial about how this event has impacted you because this is what it's all about, folks. Atlanta Science Festival is not just about blowing stuff up and elephant toothpaste. It's about science and justice and community. And that's why you're here to be a part of this Atlanta community and to use science for personal and community decision-making. So thank you so much for being here this evening and I wish you a pleasant evening. <laughs>